feeling like taking a coffee break? So do I. What about we talk again about Loom? This time, not about the virtual thread, but about the JEP 428, about structured concurrency, available as an incubator API in a JDK 19. This is still about Project Loom, probably one of the most anticipated features of the JDK 19. Let us talk about that, and yes, I heard you, you want some code, so let us see that in action on Rio. Before we start, do you know that all the team that is developing Loom as of now will be at Java One next October in Vegas, along with most of the people working on the other OpenJDK projects? I'll be there too, and I'd be super happy to share a real coffee with you, not a virtual one, Virtual coffees are nice, but a real one tastes so much better. <laughs> and if you can't make it to Vegas, stay tuned, because Java 1 is usually where everything about Java is announced. We will talk more about that. You can find all the links in the description. Okay, so we already saw in the previous Jeb Cafe that Looms brings a new kind of thread in a JDK called Virtual Threads. If you want to learn more about Volta Threads, you can watch the previous episode linked down below because we are not going to cover that again. There are two things you need to remember about Volta Threads. First, they are cheap to create and much cheaper than the regular platform threads you've been using in the JDK for many years, in fact, since the beginning of Java. Second, they are cheap to block. Blocking a platform thread is expensive and you should avoid doing that. It's not the case for virtual threads. And by the way, this is why asynchronous programming based on callbacks and futures has been developed to allow you to switch from one task to the other when this task is blocking within the same thread to avoid blocking this thread. Why? because blocking a platform thread is expensive. What is the price of asynchronous code? Well, there are three things that are not that great. First, asynchronous code is hard to write and even harder to read. We all know about that. Second, it is hard, if not impossible, to correctly unit test asynchronous code which is really an issue because unit test is what makes you sure that your code is really doing what you think it does. And third, once you begin to write asynchronous code with callbacks, because of the way asynchronous programming is designed, you end up writing asynchronous code all over the place, even for tasks that do not need to be asynchronous, that does not block anything in any way that you just need to wire on the outcome of your blocking code. So choosing to write asynchronous code based on callback is not a decision that you should make lightly because it will have an impact on all your application. And lastly, it is almost next to impossible to profile an asynchronous application. On the other hand, blocking a virtual thread is cheap. No need to try to avoid the blocking of a virtual thread, just block it, and that's it. You can write your code in a blocking synchronous way, as long as you run it on top of virtual threads, it's perfectly fine. That being said, do virtual threads solve all your problems? Mm, nope. There are still problems that need to be addressed. One of them is that because they are so cheap, you can quickly end up with millions of them in your application. And that is a problem. How can you find your way in so many threads? Will your IDE even be able to display all these threads in this little thread panel that you're used to? And if it can do that, how are you going to find the one thread you need to debug if there are millions? The real question is, 
how are you going to interact with virtual shop? Since the JDK 5, you are not supposed to interact with threads directly. The right pattern is to submit a task as a runnable or as a callable to an executor service or an executor and work with the future you get in return. In fact, Loom keeps this model and adds nice features to it. The first object I'm going to talk to you about is this scope object. The exact type is structured task scope. That's the name of the class. But we're going to call it scope just because it's simpler. What is this scope object about? Well, you can see this object as a virtual threads launcher. You submit tasks to it in the form of callables. You get a future in return. And this callable is being executed in a virtual threads created for you by the scope. Plain and simple. You may be thinking that it really looks like an executor, and it does. But there are also big differences between executors and scopes that you're going to see. Suppose you want to query a weather forecast server, and we're really going to do that because I created such a server on the web. So here is the code that is going to query it. Here I have a read weather method. Let me visit it. It's just reading this weather from A, Weather is a basic record with a server name as a string of character and the weather forecast itself also as a string of character. This method is just creating an instance of weather from a JSON object because this is what our server is sending us. And now I have this read weather from A method that is just basic HTTP client code that launches a request on this URL then gets the response, and if the status code is 200, it creates a weather instance from the JSON it gets. So let me just run this code. We are currently running Loom from the early access branch, and you can see that we could query this server in roughly 500 milliseconds. So now let me make this code asynchronous. For that, I need a scope object, so I'm going to create it. It's a structured task scope instance. It has a parameter, which is going to be weather. And because this structured task scope instance is in fact auto-closable, I'm going to surround it with a try with resources pattern. The first step for this course pattern is that we're going to fork a task, which is going to be a callable. And this callable is going to simply be weather.readweather from A. That's a callable. And then once you've done that, you need to call the join method of this scope object. This fork method, in fact, returns a future object. I'm going to call it future, future A, because it's read weather from A. And getting this future object is non-blocking. You get it immediately. Now, when you call this join method, join is a blocking call that will block this thread until all the tasks that you've submitted to this structured task scope are complete. So when join returns, then you know that future A is complete and you can just call result now on this future. Result now with throw an exception if you call it and if the future is not complete. So you really need to do that after the call to join. And this is going to be your weather. Let me call it weather A. Great. And now I can return weather A just like that. And if I run this code again, of course, the result will be the same. And that's it. This is how you can use a scope super simple. At this point, you may be thinking, eh, all this mess just for that. Bear with me, there is more to be seen on these scope objects. First, what are the differences between a scope object and an executor service? Well, there are two main differences. The first one is that you create your executors when your application is launched and you shut them down when your application is done. An executor service has the same life cycle as your application. This is how you should be using executor services because executor services hold platform threads and platform threads are expensive to create. So you want to pull them. They are precious. On the other hand, a scope is just a launcher for virtual threads. You don't need to pull virtual threads because virtual threads are cheap. So once you are done with a scope, 
You can just close it and garbage it. No problem. The second difference is that an executor holds a single queue. All your tasks are added to this queue and the different threads from this executor service will take them one at a time when they have the opportunity. A scope, on the other hand, is built on a fork join pool. So each thread has its own waitlist. In case a thread is not doing anything, and I'm not sure when this could happen, to be honest, it can steal a task from another queue. This pattern is called the work stealing pattern, and it is implemented by fork join pools in a JDK. Right, let us go one step further. Suppose you want to query several weather forecast servers instead of just one. This could speed up your process because all your results are supposed to be equivalent. So once you get the first one, you can cancel all the others. It turns out that there is a special scope for that, that does exactly that. It is an extension of the basic structured task scope class, and it is called the structured task scope dot shutdown on success. And yes, there is also a shutdown on failure class. So what does this shutdown on success scope do? Well, let us take a look at it. The pattern to use this shutdown on success scope is exactly the same as the other one. We're going to open this shutdown on success dot shutdown on success. It's also parameters by weather. And then I'm going to call more than one weather forecast. So let me call B and C. And I'm just going to duplicate this method, B and C. This is C and it's calling three. And this is B and it's calling two. Now I have, so this is read weather from B and read weather from C. And now I get three futures, future A, future B and future C. And the way this shutdown on success is working is that it will take the first future to provide an answer and cancel all the others. So instead of calling result A dot now, I'm now going to call scope dot result and get rid of this. This throw an execution exception. Fine. It doesn't throw this IO exception anymore. And I'm going to print the state of these different futures. Future A dot state. Same for B, same for C. So let me just do that, future B, future C. Let me run this code again. And you can see that future A is the winner. It was the first to provide an answer. And this shutdown on success scope canceled automatically the two other tasks that are future B and future C. These two are in a failed state, meaning that they have been interrupted by the scope itself. Let me go back to the code. We do not need this code. In fact, this is just technical code. So the futures are in fact out of our scope code. And this is the code you need to write to just query several servers and get the result of the first that is going to give you an answer. Let me just go one step further and show you a little trick. Here, I just extracted a private method read weather from just to put the URL in a parameter which is probably much cleaner than the previous version of the code with all the duplicate code. And now what I would like to show you is that you can use the stream API to launch this kind of thing. See, I'm going to put all these URLs in a stream, one, two, and three. This is two and three. And what I can do is map this URL. So this is my URL. And now I need to make it a callable of weather, read weather from this URL. But I also need to tell this map method that the return type of the function I just wrote is in fact a callable. And there is no way the compiler can infer that. So I need to tell the map method there that this is in fact a function that returns a callable of weather. And now this code is compiling. And now that I have a stream of callable, I can just pass this callables to scope fork. So if you write the code in that way, then you do not need this code anymore. And if you run it, of course, it will give you the exact same result. So as you can see, it is possible to write this with a stream. It is perfectly legal because in this stream, nothing is blocking. This call to fork is not blocking. I'm not so sure that writing it with a stream improved the readability. So maybe I will get rid of this ugly code.
and stick to the previous pattern. The pattern to use this shutdown on success scope is exactly the same as the other one. You open, you fork your tasks, you join, and you get the result. The way it works is a little different though. Here I have all the future objects, and when the join returns, there is one future that is done and the others have been cancelled. This is very handy. The interruptions are handled by the scope itself. And by the way, you don't need to get these future objects. You can just call the result method on the scope object to get your result. No need to handle the future objects there. Your business code becomes much cleaner without any technical objects in your way. Futures are technical objects. You just fork your tasks, call join, call result, and that's it. Why is it possible to do so? Well, precisely because the scope object is in fact specialized. It is business focused. It processes one business need instead of blindly processing all the asynchronous tasks of your application. What is happening if a task fails with an exception? Well, it depends on the scope. For the shutdown on success scope, this task will not be selected to produce a result. But now, if all your tasks are failing, then you will get an execution exception with the exception from the first future that completed as a root code. Could it be possible to go one step further and create your own business scope? Well, you cannot extend shutdown on success because it's a final class, but you can still wrap it, you can still compose it if this is what you want, but you can certainly extend structured task scope. So let us do that. Suppose that instead of weather forecast, we are now going to query quotations for a travel agency. And as we did for the weather forecast, we need to query several quotation servers to get the best price possible. The code you want to write is the following. Fork the queries on the quotation server, called join because this is how scopes are working, and then just called best quotation, just as you called result on this structured task scope dot shutdown success. Now, of course, there is no best quotation method on this structured task scope class. So what we really need to do is create our own class. And instead of having that, having a quotation scope. I'm going to create this class there, public class quotation scope extends structured task scope to make it work. And now it's okay to have a best quotation in this class that is going to return null because it's my class, I can do whatever I want with it. Now, of course, you need to add some code to this quotation class. And there is, in fact, one method that you need to override, which is a callback on the completion of your future objects. Once a task is done and the future is complete, then there is a method handle complete that is called with that future object as an argument. So let me override this method. It's this one, handle complete, okay? It takes a future as an argument and the future it takes is complete. So what I need to do is check for the state of this future. And I don't have that many state. I basically have only four. Let me first begin by running. This method should not be called with a running future. So if it is the case, by all means, report this bug on the Loom mailing list, because yes, that's a bug that needs to be fixed. But I still need to handle this case. So let me throw this new illegal state exception. Future is still running and it should not be. Of course, the state I'm going to prefer is the success state. Now, what is going to happen if my future is in success? It means that, in fact, this future is carrying a result, which is a quotation, and I need to put this quotation somewhere. So I'm going to add it to a collection, these quotations dot add future dot result now. So this is going to be a collection. I'm going to create it there, a collection of quotation, just like that. And now I need to think about it, right? This quotation scope object is created by the thread who is calling read quotation. And all these handle complete method there are called 
in a virtual thread that executed the future that is passed as an argument. So it means that I have a potential race condition on this quotations reference. This quotations collection is created in a thread and another thread is reading this reference to add content to it. So you can put it volatile if you want, but putting it final is okay. You just need to make sure that this final keyword there is there to make this quotations reference visible. And now the collection itself should not be just a plain array list because the content added to this collection, all these quotation objects, are going to be added from different threads. So this has to be a concurrent collection. So let me make it a concurrent linked deck. Yeah, that's going to be fine. Something like that. Now I have a thread safe collection and the reference to this collection is visible. So my code is correct from the concurrency point of view. Right, I have another case to handle, which is the case fail. Fail is the case where this quotation could not be read because for instance, the server was not up or there was a 404 error, this kind of thing. I'm going to put this exception in the same kind of collection as the previous one, future.exception now, all right? And the same goes for this collection. I'm going to duplicate that, okay? This is a collection of Thrable because this is what exception now is returning and this is exceptions. And the last case is the canceled case. Cancel means that this future could not be executed until the end, maybe the scope was shut down, maybe the thread was interrupted. There's nothing much I can do about it. So I'm just going to do nothing. All right. So now I have a first quotations collection with the quotations in it and the second one with some exceptions. So what can I do in this best quotation method? Well, all I need to do is analyze the content of this quotations collection with a very simple pattern, which is basically a string pattern. I want to extract a mean. So let me just take the mean comparing sting with the price and then call or else a throw on the optional I get. Now, we need to write this code carefully. When is this or else a throw method going to throw an exception? Going to throw an exception when the optional is empty. The optional is empty if the quotations collection is itself empty. If I have one element in it, then I will not have any exception. How could this quotation exception be empty? How could that happen? Well, if success is never called because failed is always called, it means that quotations will be empty and I will have a bunch of exceptions in this exceptions collection. So maybe I need to check that. I'm going to create another method, public exception exceptions. Okay. And by the way, you know what? I'm going to create my own application exception, quotation exception. Just make it a static class that extends a runtime exception. Okay. And I'm going to create such an exception, new quotation exception. And I'm going to add all the exceptions from this exceptions collection as suppressed exception to this quotation exception. So let me do that in that way, this exceptions for each. And now I am going to take this exception and call exception dot add suppressed e. And by the way, this is a nice method reference. So let me just write this code in that way and return this exception. All right. So now I have a method that will take all the exceptions from these collections and that will gather them in one mother exceptions of type quotation exception. And now what I can do is pass a supplier of exception to this or else a throw. And by the way, this is another method reference. So if my quotations collection is empty, then I will throw one exception with all the exceptions that these futures through. And by the way, you can even call this method in your business code just to check what happened with your tasks. If one of them is constantly failing, then you can get that information and probably do something about it. So let me run this code and see how this quotation object is working. You can see that this time agency D answered with a price of 39. Let me run it again. And now the bus server was server C price 33. And you can see that compared to the classical asynchronous code with callback, this code is itself fully asynchronous. Each quotation is conducted in its own thread, but with a pattern that is completely synchronous. The nice thing with this scope object is that you can write your code in a synchronous way, following very simple patterns, but it is executed in an asynchronous way based on virtual threads. 
So that's the final code. As you can see, your business code is super simple. Fork your tasks, call join, and then call your own business method. That will produce the result you need. The technical part of your code is also simple. All you need to do is write a callback to handle your future objects, one future at a time. And then add your business code that will decide how to reduce your partial results. Writing your unit tests is also super simple. You can create a completed future with a result or an exception directly with the API. Don't create mocks for that. You can create a complete future with completableFuture.completeFuture and pass the value you need. Or if you need a failing future, you can use completableFuture.failedFuture and pass the exception you want to throw. So really, writing unit tests for this class is super easy. Okay, can we assemble our quotation and weather forecast in a nice travel page? What about we create a travel page record and put a quotation and a weather forecast in it? Let me do that. Here I have a read travel page factory method that is not compiling because it should rely on a travel page scope. Just as we created the quotation scope, we're going to create this scope. So let me do it here public static class travel page scope is going to extend the structured task scope. And now we are facing our first problem is that the structured task scope class is parameterized by a type that should be common to all the callables that you're going to submit to this scope. Currently, the only common type between weather and quotation is the object type, which is not that great. We would like to have a more precise type on that. So let me create a page component type. Let me create it as an interface. And let me say that weather is going to implement this interface and the same for quotation. Let me go back to travel page. Now I can submit read weather and read quotation to this page component. By the way, these two static methods, read weather and read quotation are launching their own scope, which is perfectly fine. And all we need now is a travel page method in this scope object. And of course, to override this handle complete method, just as we did with the quotation. So let me handle this running case right now. And now we are going to focus on the success case. So the future I have here can carry either a quotation object or a weather object. So maybe I can switch again on the type of this future object result now and uh, if it is a weather object then uh, i need to save it this weather equals weather and if it is a quotation object i'm also going to save it somewhere okay so now i need two fields private quotation quotation and private weather weather now you need to be careful because there is a race condition here. So these two fields should be volatile. All right. This uh, switch on type is not compiling currently because there's a glitch in the IDE that I'm using as of now. It's a preview feature of an early access version. And unfortunately, I cannot tell this IDE that it should activate that. Maybe it will be the case in the future, but it's not the case right now. And this switch on the types will fail because I need a default section there that will do nothing. But it's really a pity to have that because in fact, what I could do is an exhaustive switch as long as this page component is a sealed interface. So let me make it a sealed interface. And let me just say that the only authorized types are quotation and weather. And now if I go back to this switch, I do not need this default case anymore. Right, so now I am going to handle the fail case and the fail case will be kind of the same. Here I can either have a quotation exception or any other type of exception. I'm going to switch on the type of the exception once again, take exception now. In the case it's a quotation exception, so that's an exception. Then I'm going to say that this exception 
is equal to this exception. And in the default case, let me call that this quotation exception and say that this exception is equal to exception. And now I need to create these two fields private volatile quotation exception and the other one is in fact a throwable and I'm going to call it exception. Now bear with me, even if this code has glitches, it will compile and run just fine. I just need one last case, which is the cancel case, and in that case I'm not going to do much. Now that I have processed all the cases about the futures that I'm going to get, I can focus on my business code, which is this travel page method. You see that here I have an interesting business case, because there is one information, basically the weather, that is just nice to have. If I don't have it, I can still show something to my client. But the quotation is itself critical. If I do not have the quotation, I do not have a travel page. So let me just implement that. If the quotation is null, then I'm probably in trouble. Basically, I have two cases. If this quotation exception is not null, it means that something wrong happened when I was trying to query my quotation servers. So maybe I do something like new runtime exception, this quotation exception, okay. And if this quotation exception is null, it means that something else very wrong happened and I'm not sure what. So here I'm just going to go this runtime exception, this exception, and I hope that this exception is not null, but it should not be null because if it is, then there is something that is very, very wrong in my system. And if this quotation is not null, then this is the happy path of my use case. I can return a travel page. So let me do that. Return a new travel page, this quotation, and this weather. Instead of returning this weather that could be null, what I could do, okay, I'm going to cut this, is use this nifty factory method from the object class, which is require non-null else. And then I can pass this weather. If this weather is non-null, then it will be returned by this factory method. But if it is null, it will use this other value, which is a default value. We are going to say that the server is unknown and the weather is mostly sunny. And now I have all my business rules in this travel page method that I could unit test very easily, by the way. The read travel page code is also super simple. Once again, it is written in a synchronous way, but it's really asynchronous code because this read weather and read quotation methods are in fact asynchronous methods. So let me run this code. And you can see that I have my travel page with the quotation server C price 31 and the weather forecast server E sunny. There are two last things I would like to show you. First, I would like to add a timeout on this weather forecast. I wouldn't want my visitors to wait for 10 minutes just because I cannot get the weather forecast quickly enough. So it turns out that there's a nifty method called join until that does exactly that. So instead of calling join, let me call join until. This join until method takes a deadline as an instance. So if you want to pass a deadline, you can just call instant now and then add the milliseconds. Let me add a thousand of them. Add the exception to the method signature, which is a timeout exception. And run this code again, just to see what it gives. Basically, I am still having uh, the correct weather forecast. Let me put a little more pressure on it, like 10 milliseconds. I'm sure I will have no answer in 10 milliseconds, so we are going to see the default value for the weather forecast. Now you can see that the weather forecast we have is from an unknown server and the weather is mostly sunny. So this is how you can handle timeouts with these scope objects. By the way, if you want to handle this exception separately, you can also add a branch in this switch statement. And the second thing I would like to show you is how you can handle thread local in this case. You remember thread local, this old stuff from the JK1? Loom's virtual threads fully support thread locals, so if you want to stick with them, you can do that but you can also do much better. Loom adds a new concept called extant local. 
Extant Local is not part of the structured concurrency incubator API, but you can already play with them with the Loom Early Access builds. Extant Local allow you to give a value to a variable and run a task within the context of this value. Let me show you how this is working. First, you need to create an extant local variable with a given type, and for that you have a factory method extant local new instance. And then you can create a runnable, let me call it task, and it will do the following. If the key is bound, it will print the value of this key, which is basically key.get. And if it's not the case, then it will just print not bound. And of course, if I run this code, it will tell me that the key is not bound. But now what I'm going to do is call extant local, where key has the value a, and within this context, I'm going to run this runnable. And by the way, you can see that I could also execute a callable. So let me just run this task, okay, in that context, and do the same with a value that is b. So let me run this code. And now you can see that in a first run, the key was bound to the value a, and this is what our task saw. And in the second run, the key was bound to the value b, and this is also what our task saw. So this is a very powerful mechanism just to share variable among different tasks and among different threads. In this case, I'm not running in a multi-threaded environment. I did not create any new thread, so really everything took place in the main thread. But of course, you can make it work in scopes and threads, so let us do that. I just added this code to the quotation record. First created a license, which is an extant local variable of type string, and then added this validation rule to the compact constructor of this quotation record. Basically, if the license has not been bound, and if the value is not license A, then no quotation record can be created, because there is this illegal state exception that will be thrown. So let me go back to this example, run it, and now you see our suppressed exception mechanism that we set up with the quotation exception. The quotation exception has been thrown, that's one exception, and it has a bunch of illegal state exceptions, no license found because this record could not be created. So let me bind this extant local to a value. I can do it in that way. Extant local where quotation.license has the value license A. And now I can call this callable travel page, read travel page. I can get rid of this one. This is a nice method reference. And let me run this code again. And now everything is fine. The license has been found. By the way, if I put a wrong value, you will see that I will have these illegal state exceptions again. Great, they are there. Let me put A again. And you can also see that this extant local has been set on the travel page. So this license was made available at the travel page level and transmitted to all the scope created within this travel page. The travel page is executed in its own scope, but it creates another scope for the quotation and another scope for the weather. And in fact, this extent local is available on all the scopes created by this travels page scope. Just remember though, this extent local API is not part of the structured concurrency incubator API, it's in the Loom Early Access distribution. So you can see that using these scope objects makes your code much simpler than having to write callbacks within callbacks within callbacks. Your code is synchronous, it is blocking, but it is fine because it's running on top of virtual threads and it is much easier to read. Creating scopes is really easy. All you need to do is override this handle complete method that handles one future at a time in a synchronous way, so it's super easy to write. And then you can handle your exceptions as you need, including timeouts. And with the partial results and your exceptions, you can add your business code 
following your business rules, this is basically what we did in the examples that you just saw. You can also easily write unit tests, whether it is for your scope objects or your regular classes. So in the end, your application is fully asynchronous, but it does not rely on nested callbacks, only on code written in a synchronous way. And that's a huge step forward. If you want to learn more on this subject and get information from the source, remember again that all the team that develops Loom will be present at Java One next October in Vegas, along with the other teams of the OpenJDK. And I'll be super happy to see you there and share a coffee with you. So please check the links down below. You also have pointer to other videos made by my friends Nikolai and Billy. And if you have any comments or questions, well, you know what to do. And with this, I'm out of coffee. So that's it for today. Talk to you soon.